grateful that you're here for all of our campuses as we unite together, understanding the significance of this moment. No one's here by accident, no one's here by happenstance. And if you're with us for the very first time, it's our highest honor to have you. Let this thunderous applause be a statement of our gratitude. Thank you for coming. Honored that you're here. Make sure you stop by one of our welcome spaces, pick up a free gift as a statement of our gratitude for your presence amongst us. There are two realities at the end of this service. If you need prayer, need somebody to talk to, you need that 2 a.m. friend, our hope and prayer is to be able to connect you with that. Also let you know that the weights that you carry into whatever location you're at, sometimes they're unbeknownst to the people around you. Oftentimes we think people have it all together, but in reality they're unraveling at the seams and God brought you to a place to let you know that the weights that you're carrying, God could carry. He's bigger, he's stronger, he's faithful. And so we just let each and every one of you know that we have a moment of prayer at the end of the service with our prayer team. And if you give your life to Jesus, by the way, we think it's the greatest decision you could ever make. Can I go ahead and just prophesy today that we believe in faith that somebody's gonna give their life to Jesus. We'd love for you to get a Bible, love for you to allow our, our house to celebrate that decision. I wanna take a moment to honor Senator Donna Campbell, who is a CBC member. I wanna say thank you. Would you stand, Senator Campbell? Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your fight against fentanyl in our state. Thank you for bringing so much legislative power and also just in a very cool way, how you represent not only your family, your mama, your emergency room doctor, but you're also a CBCer and you're a dear friend. And I just wanna say thank you for your faithfulness as you bring God into the conversation of government. And one more time, we just wanna honor you, amen. Thank you so much, Senator Campbell, appreciate you. And so as we have a conversation today concerning Bible and politics, we know this to be true, that this has been historically a dividing conversation, but not in our house. We have been called, Philippians chapter three, verse 20, that we are kingdom citizens. So we lift our eyes to the hill in which our help comes from. Our help is in a king. Our allegiance is not to a political party. Do we care about political parties? Absolutely, we should. And as we seek to have this conversation, what I want us to be able to receive today is a higher calling to a message and to a mission that Jesus rules and reigns forever. He's not up for vote. He's on the throne now, forever. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Come on, can we just receive that today? Would that be all right? Our hope is not in a political party. Our hope is in Jesus Christ alone. So let's open up our hands across our house, every campus, additional seating, overflow, all of those that are watching online. Father God, we thank you for your promises, your principles and your precepts. We just say to you, Jesus, our allegiance is to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said amen and amen. Well, if you got a listener guide, we're gonna begin this conversation today concerning the Bible and politics, but I mentioned it in the target statement. Our hope is not in a political party, but in Jesus Christ alone and voting our biblical conscience with a a very visceral biblical conviction is something that you and I must not take lightly. I, I believe more than ever, I've been so persuaded and convinced by the Holy Spirit to be guided in this conversation. Here's the reason why, because for those who call themselves Christians, and I, and I, I just, it's gonna be hard for me to sit down because this is such a passionate conversation for me, it, it is because when we talk about Christians, it's an interesting, and I don't air quote, I just need you to know I'm not an air quote guy, but I, I need to air quote that one because of the fact that it's interesting that most people would say they're a Christian just because they were born in the United States of America. That, that would be the equivalent of you walking into your favorite local coffee shop and thinking that by you walking in, you became a Frappuccino. That, that's exactly what that means. And, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to be a little spicy already at the beginning of a sermon like this, but, but I need you to know what a Christian means. Can I just define what a Christian means? Because demons and Satan believe in Christ. What, what does it actually mean to be a follower of Jesus? It means that you repent of sin, understanding that you cannot get into a perfect heaven because heaven is holy, we ain't holy. Can I use in proper English today? We ain't holy, ain't none of us holy, except for the fact that God calls us holy, and the only way that God calls us holy is when we receive the Holy One, which is Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. There's not many ways to heaven. I, I, I don't know what you've heard in recent day. I don't know what you've been taught in recent years, but I need you to know there's only one way to heaven. Eternity is too long to be wrong, and for those that come to the cross and see the empty tomb, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It's not up for debate. It's not up for discussion. Anybody that walks out their grave 
doesn't just get my vote. They get my heart. And Jesus Christ is king. And so when a person says that they are a Christ follower and we choose to follow Jesus, then what Jesus values and what Jesus upholds and the scripture that he would teach, the whole council, Genesis to Revelation and understanding that this is the blueprint of how God has determined that you and I are to live in blessing. You cannot choose to just obey a few things and seek blessing from God. It's, it's an understanding that we have to come before God in our humility. It doesn't mean that we're not perfect. Can I tell you what a Christian means? It means that we're not perfect, but we just pursue the perfect one. And so when we fall down, we get back up again. Jesus has our allegiance. But as we speak of voting our biblical conscience with a biblical conviction, what, what is that? And what does that mean? And I have been more convinced than ever that there are a lot of people that really do have a relationship with Jesus but unfortunately view conversations in the political arena and they all of a sudden take their biblical worldview and they move it aside and begin to embrace politics through popularity or maybe in regards to a candidate that maybe their hearts gravitate towards to in regards to their presentation or even a family voting history. And my hope and prayer for us is that we would understand that we're followers of God. His word matters. We love what he loves. We hate what he hates. Which, by the way, God loves all people. He hates sin. And we have to be a people that understand that God does not glorify sin. He does not magnify sin because Jesus died for sin that we could walk in purpose and fulfillment and destiny. Come on, can we clap to this all, all across our house? This, this is the biblical mandate for us. But I want us to walk through systematically through this conversation of the Bible and politics. I want to begin with a statement. Our vote is not just your voice, it's your testimony of your value system. Your vote is not just your voice, it actually tells me how you view the world. And when you and I think about our value system and being Christians, and our value system should be shaped by the principles of God's word. It's the understanding of what God would say to us. And when we talk about separation of church and state, but not God and government, it's an interesting conversation because I believe a lot of Christians, and I use that term Christians as Christ followers, don't understand separation of church and state. I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence, but I was confused about this until recent year. But here's the definition. It's important for Christians because this protects and provides religious liberty without government interference privately and publicly. I put this in the notes. It prevents a state religion, protects from religious persecution, and allows freedom of speech. Now. I was in a podcast and someone said, hey man, can you just say it like to a middle school student? Can you make it just really simple? Separation of church and state prevents the government from controlling your message and determining your mission. So when we talk about separation of church and state, that, that is actually something that we hold dear because we do not want the government to control the message and we don't want the government to control our mission. But when you and I think about some of the challenges that we're facing, when the Bible talks about gender being male and female and marriage between man and woman and sanctity of life and these things that the Bible would say are closed fist issues and we'll speak to this in just a few moments, then what do we do when, the, when, when there are government policies that would say this is anti-discriminatory, which by the way, we never belittle people. All people are made in the image of God. We do not demonize people. We love all people, but can we respectfully disagree at moments and go, my Bible says this and you say this but as for me and my house, we're gonna stand on these principles. They're, they're not up for debate, not up for discussion. However, I can respectfully hear what you're saying, but I gotta make a decision. Whether it's right to obey you, to obey God, I choose God. But when we think about some of the legal challenges, such as when we talk about marriage and we talk about homosexuality and transgenderism, these, these major conversational points that the Bible actually speaks to. When you and I think about some of the legal challenges, the landscape gets really complex because there's so many particular court cases that are dealing with denying services uh, unto transgenderism or even homosexuality based upon wedding venues, ba based upon bakery services, where people are going, my religious freedom, my religious liberty says I am held captive to my convictions Am I not allowed to deny services? I, I respect you, I, I honor you, but I'm choosing to say I cannot participate in this. And, and is this a legal infringement of rights? And this is where we're at today. 
such as even amongst Chick-fil-A with owner operators that would say, we believe in this, we uphold this, we support entities of this, and then it creates exclusion in other places and protesting and boycotting. This is a real issue that we're dealing with, but when we think about God and government, now watch this, God and government. God is sovereign over all rulers, leaders, nations, all authorities must reflect morality, justice, mercy, righteousness, but when not upheld, those who are spiritual must speak out. Now, I've been accused of a lot of things, but, but one of the things that's been interesting about the trending series is that the trending series is trending. I, I don't know if you know that the trending series is trending, but when we talk about separation of church and state, it's actually, and this is one of the accusatory statements that's been shared in my direction, is that it feels like, Pastor Ed, you're forcing your beliefs, which by the way are not my beliefs, they're, they're biblical beliefs, on the government. You're forcing it on them. However, I'd say not at all. It's actually the understanding that government exists because God puts them in positions of leadership. It's also understanding that people are in leadership because God has chosen them to be in leadership and blessing comes from God on a nation when there's alignment to God. And so when a nation chooses to be under God, but then all of a sudden changes its mind and says, no, actually we wanna be over God or maybe side by side with God, then God chooses to hold back his blessing. But I believe in faith that when God's people called by his name confess their sin, then God forgives their sin and heals their land. And we're believing in faith that God, God could revive a nation when we come back underneath God. But once more, many people would say, well, Pastor Ed, you, you gotta stop being so political, but can I ask you a question? What, what, what do you do with the fact of this statement? The Bible is not a political book, but it speaks to politics. What, what do you do with this? What, what do you do with Moses that confronts Pharaoh? What do you do with Esther that prevented a genocide? What do you do with Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that look at a statue and go, it is the law of the land. You're the most poor, powerful man in the world. And you're telling us that we bow down and worship this image. 90 feet tall image. Plain of Dura, not Dora. She's awesome, but Dura, all right? <laughs> bow down, you die. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego end up in the fiery furnace. God will not always protect us from the fiery furnace, but sometimes he will protect us from within the fiery furnace, and we have to go through trial and tribulation. But when we understand the scriptures, what about Peter and John? What about John the Baptist that confronts the wicked king of the day? What do we do with the prophets of Elijah, Elisha, Nehemiah? What do we do with Jeremiah and Amos? What do we do with Isaiah? Matter of fact, what do we do with historical individuals such as John Bunyan, Dietrich Bonhoeffer that confronts the Nazi regime? What do we do with William Wilberforce that says to Europe, it's wrong to have slaves, men of faith? What, what do we do with Nelson Mandela? What, what do we do with Sojourner Truth? What do we do with Dr. Martin Luther King that in his iconic I dream speech, I have a dream, four scriptures were used. Would we be silent in the 60s because we can't mix the Bible and politics? Or would we have spoken up and said, God's word says, and I believe there's times where a man of God or a woman of God or a preacher of God and a prophet of God has got to understand that the Bible's not a political book, but it speaks to politics. What do you do with Jesus that was turned over to a Roman government, by the way, Jesus willingly laid down his life. But it was a government with some religious leaders that put him on a Roman cross. What, what do you do with the moment when Jesus, by the way, was asked, is it lawful to pay taxes? Anybody else? Come on. I wish Jesus would have said something different, man. I, I honestly, <laughs> I wish Jesus been like, don't pay taxes, man. It would have been so much different. But, but listen, there's sweet Jesus and then there's savage Jesus. And this is savage Jesus. They, they thought they could back Jesus up in a corner with this political. It's interesting. So many times we're like, Jesus didn't have political conversations. Every day he was having political conversations. But when we talk about when they backed him up in the corner, it was like, is it lawful to pay taxes? Jesus goes, bring me a coin. Bring me a coin. All of a sudden he gets the coin. They're like, we got him now. We got him. And he goes, whose image is on the coin? They're like, Caesar's. 
then Jesus goes, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But that's not a period, that's a comma. Then he goes, but render to God what belongs to God. Now watch this. He goes, if it's got Caesar's name on it, then we are to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Submit unto authority. But then he says this, but whoever has the image of God on it, that's who it belongs to. Many preachers have actually used that particular section of scripture to preach a sermon on tithing. That's not what it has. It has nothing to do with tithing. It has everything to do with if Caesar's image is on the coin, then you've got to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And then God just, oh, let me just say this. Then, then Jesus says, but whoever has the image of God on him or her, not the image of a political party, not, not the image of an elephant, not the image of a donkey, but the image of God Almighty, then God, then God Almighty says, then, then there is a demand that yes, you render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but you render to God what belongs to God. So what is God saying? Whoever's got the image on it of God, Imago Dei, who does it belong to? God. My life belongs to God. My allegiance belongs to God. Render to God what belongs to God. So what is God saying? All of me belongs to you. So our biblical convictions and our kingdom value comes from the fact that we are image bearers of God. But here's the biblical considerations. Just a couple of thoughts in regards to casting a vote. Once more, your vote is not just your voice, it's your testimony. We should seek an individual to be not only in the Oval Office or individuals in regards to our state and local government that demonstrates righteous leadership. Not, not all candidates will be Christians. However, we have to ask the question, Proverbs 29, verse two, what an interesting word that this is for us. When we talk about Proverbs 29, verse two, it says, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice. Amen? Oh, come on, y'all got 17, listen. South side, I, I, you got to help me preach this thing. North side, y'all got to help me preach this. It says, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice. 42 of you, it's okay. But when the, but when the wicked rule, the people groan. And that, yeah, amen. And that's an understatement. It's an understatement. But when we talk about biblical considerations and casting a vote, here's what you have to understand, is that you're not voting for a pastor. You're voting for a president, of which no person is sinless. There are faults in every person, including me, including you. However, a president should be selected on the basis of demonstrating ethical behavior, respect for human dignity, a commitment to serving all people, especially the marginalized. As we talk about a candidate seeking the sovereignty of a nation, Acts 17, verse 26, we talked about this. There are no borders. A nation with no borders is not a nation. It's important that a nation protect the sovereignty of a nation with the sense of not making decisions at the expense of a nation. It should seek the well-being of of a nation and the people that live within a nation and protecting its sovereignty against other nations trying to make our nation like their nation. When we talk about seeking advocacy for justice, law, and order, and protection of citizens, Micah 6, 8 says, what does the Lord require of you to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God? A candidate is positioned in the Oval Office that has the ability to appoint 4,000 judges. That is a significant statement to a political conversation, it's not just representation in the Oval Office, it's also representation in regards to morals and values and principles of governance that are applied to our court system. Therefore, such leaders should recognize that governance is not about just winning political battles, it's about serving the common good of people in a nation. As we think about seeking the welfare, it also seeks the kingdom of God. We as Christians are called to seek the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, seek first your political party. No, seek first the kingdom of God. Political platforms will fluctuate. How many of you have noticed this? Political parties based upon yesteryear and this current year, and you can look back to the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and now in the 2000s, you can see political parties are moving and shifting and fluctuating. But what does not move? The kingdom of God. Principles of God do not fluctuate with culture. They transcend culture. So when you and I think about the kingdom of God and the values of it, it's essential that we evaluate policies and candidates through the lens of scripture. 
We cannot allow our family heritage, popular vote, but instead we have to ask the question, what does God love? What does God hate? I'll say it again, God hates sin. God loves the sinner, but we can't love the sin and minimize the Savior. That's not our role. Now, I I can't speak to all people, but I'm speaking to people who say Jesus Christ is my Savior. We have to hate what God hates. What does God hate? Sin. So we as the people of God, with a responsibility, are called of God to be individuals that seek the great reality of a kingdom coming to earth. Watch this. And I believe this is a very significant statement. Don't miss what I'm about to say. This election is not about right or left. This election is about up versus down. You go, Ed, whoa, 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 I'm confused. Because if you're not careful, it's right or it's left. But what if I were to tell you it's actually up versus down? You go, Ed, Ed you got to break that down. Up, what, what's up, what's up? It's the kingdom of heaven. What's down, the pit of hell. And the kingdom of heaven wants to come down. The Lord's prayer is not just to be prayed at basketball games. The the Lord's prayer is let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. But at the same time, there's a dominion of hell that wants to bring about destruction in this world that will use even politicians as pawns and people as pawns, and even Christians that are blinded by truth for cultural popularity and not to be canceled in culture. When you and I think about the promises of God, our role as followers of God, usher in the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of darkness will be stopped. And that's not a right or left issue, that's an up and down issue. It's that the kingdom of God should prevail. Come on church, can we clap to that? And we usher that in. We usher that in. So as we think about living as kingdom citizens, it's important that we recognize our identity is in Christ alone, not our political parties, not our political candidates. Give your vote to your candidate, but give your heart to Jesus. That's the message. Matter of fact, as we we talk about being ambassadors for Christ, and maybe you haven't heard that terminology, but do you know 2 Corinthians chapter 5? I love verse 17. We just talked about, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation, old is gone, new has come. What's my identity? In Christ, not Republican, not Democrat, which, by the way, I'm having a hard time sitting down. I'm just being honest with you. Um, The the question I'm asked all the time, Pastor Ed, are are you Democratic or are you politically Republican or are you independent? I'm going, no, no, I'm, I'm, a king, I'm kingdom independent. I, I love how Pastor Tony Evans says this. He says it better than I've ever heard it. He was like, I'm, I'm a kingdom independent, which means that every election cycle, I ask the question, biblical convictions, if you approach any election, national, local, state level, and you are determining how you vote with no filter of a Bible, No filter of your Christian convictions. If you move this aside, then the question is, when we say vote your biblical conviction and biblical conscience, we have to ask the question, then where are you getting that from? Which preacher is giving you that? Which spiritual guru is giving you that? It's the word of God that shapes this conversation. The Bible's not a book of suggestions. The Bible's a roadmap for life. And and God's way is better. But when we think about our identity is in Christ and we're ambassadors, do you you know that 2 Corinthians chapter five is that verse, we are ambassadors. That's a political term. That we represent a kingdom citizenship. If I'm an ambassador for the United States of America in another nation, I don't speak on my own accord. I don't speak on my own authority. I have been given a, 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 a jurisdiction of leadership as a representative of the United States of America. I speak on behalf of the president. If I am an ambassador of the United States in another foreign land, I dwell in an embassy. I live in a jurisdiction of of governmental permission. Same applies to Christians and followers of Jesus Christ. My authority comes from God Almighty. My authority as a son and for you a daughter of the living God comes from King Jesus. 
And as an ambassador, I don't speak what I just want to speak. I don't say what I want to say. I speak on behalf of the king. And when you and I think about this message, here's what I'm trying to convince us of. If we talk more about politics and the principles of God's word, or we talk more about candidates than Christ, or we read, watch, or listen to news outlets more than we read our Bible, then we're anchored in our hope in the wrong place. And as you and I think about the question of my identity, my ambassadorship, am I transformed by the Holy Spirit? I just wanna make a couple statements here. You and I as sons and daughters of God are to produce the fruit of the Spirit by the Holy Spirit, which means if I, in a conversation of politics, begin to demonize someone else that, by the way, is an image bearer of God, that God longs to be in relationship with them, if they're a follower of God or not a follower of God, God is wildly passionate about that person. And my heartbeat has to be the fact that I do not demonize, but instead I could dialogue, we could disagree, but I love you in Christ. But here's the promise. If somebody cuts you off in traffic and they got a bumper sticker from a political party that you're in opposition to and you hate them because of a bumper sticker, or you hate someone in your neighborhood because of a political sign, listen to me, it's a reflection that your heart is in the wrong place. It's, it's a reflection that you've allowed your heart to be anchored in the wrong place. My hope is not in a candidate. My hope is in a savior. And here's the promises of God for all of us. When we think about being transformed by the Holy Spirit of God, we are also called to be salt and light. Salt can't be salt if it don't come out the salt shaker. Light can't be light if it's hid underneath the lamp stand or a lamp shade. Salt has a particular assignment to preserve. Light has a particular assignment and mission to expose darkness. Let me ask you a question. If there was no salt, which by the way is Christians, if there's no light, which is Christians, then what happens in our nation? The moral decay of what's happening in society due to secularism, humanism, pluralism, and all the isms is, is causing a moral decay. When we live in a world that doesn't believe in absolute truth, that causes us to question whether there's only two genders or there's multiple genders. See, if the devil could get us to doubt the book of Genesis, then it crumbles the whole faith system of the rest of the Bible. So you have to recognize, is God right when he decreed man, woman, gender, male, female, nuclear family, father, a, a wife, a mama, babies, grow up to be warriors for Jesus. So when you and I think about being transformed by the Holy Spirit of God, being salt and light, our role and responsibility in any time of being in this nation is to continue to be kingdom ambassadors with an understanding that one day Christ rules and reigns. I don't know if you know this or not, but Jesus is coming back. I, I don't know if you know that or not. I, I just, if you're hearing this for the first time, he's coming back, I just need you to know, he's coming back. But you also have to recognize the first time he came, he came riding on a donkey. And what's crazy is that when we talk about, well, the Bible's not a political book. Do you, you know the reason why, and I have not said this in any other service, you know the reason why they went from Hosanna, 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 Hosanna to crucify, 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 crucify is because Jesus did not go through the gate that political leaders go through. He got to the fork in the road, saw the gate, the Eastern gate. I've seen it with my own eyes. He didn't go through the eastern gate. He actually went through the sheep gate. So they went, we want you to be our political leader. He goes, my agenda is way bigger than earthly things. My kingdom, he would say this, oh God, I can feel the Holy Spirit. John 18, my kingdom is not of this world. So he goes through a sheep gate because of the fact he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And when you and I understand that our biblical mission and mandate, can I just be real with you, man? Jesus is coming again. The first time he came on a donkey, the second time he's coming on a war horse to bring judgment to the world. Listen, if you ain't ready, you got to get ready. And if you ready, stay ready, because he's coming. He's coming. 
And so as we talk about being salt and light, we also have to understand this kingdom reigns forever. But what are our biblical convictions? What are these? When it comes to biblical convictions, considering a voting consideration, sanctity of life is a closed fist issue. When I talk about closed fist and open-handed, there's a lot of conversations that we, we could have tertiary, which means secondary conversation points. But then there's closed fist realities, and I believe that a closed fist, like not up for debate, is the sanctity of life. Sanctity of life. When we talk about sanctity of life, it's not a stance, it's scripture. Genesis 1:27, we've been made in the image of God. Psalm 139, we've been created in the inmost being. He's created us. He knit us together in our mother's womb. Jeremiah 1.5, I formed you in the womb. Therefore, I knew you before you were born. I consecrated you, the word of God says. When we think about also in that same statement is that God is the giver of life, the sustainer of life, and to bring that to an end puts you and I in the place of God, and that's not our role. And so abortion is murder. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13 would say, do not murder. And so as we talk about the sanctity of life and to actually, as Proverbs 31 would say, to speak up for the marginalized and the vulnerable, understand that includes children in the womb. Who speaks up for them? Who speaks up for that life? I believe that life begins at conception. I believe scripture teaches this and science is validating this. Is, is that when that sperm fertilizes that egg, there is actually a spark of light. God's going, let there be light. Let there be life. I believe that that person, and, and, and I'm gonna just say this, and, and this is probably a conversation for another day, but for those that have had miscarriages in my heart, oh God, my heart prays that he would just wrap you up in peace and love, that knowing that you never got a chance to meet that child, but one day you will. I believe that one day there's gonna be a sweet reunion for every parent that had a miscarriage because when life is at conception, that means that that was a precious life in the eyes of God and one day what a reunion that's gonna be. But as we talk about a pro-life stance, specifically into disability and handicap, a life should not be terminated because of preconceived notions that the quality of life due to a disability or handicap prevents them from any form of societal contributions in this world, when in reality, children with disabilities oftentimes bring extraordinary gifts and perspectives and experiences that teach people to not take for granted or actually have an open-eyed perspective to how life should be lived. I'm the, I'm the product of two people that were told they could never have children, two people that were handicapped, and my mom, who was told she'd never have children, had cerebral palsy and was also deaf, and I honor my mom and my dad for the fact that they just, in faith, believed that God had a different plan and a different, a different way of helping them raise a child. And for me, when we talk about the scripture, we also have to talk about rape and incest. 1% of abortions are rape and incest. The trauma, and I wanna just be really intentional, the trauma of injustice is unspeakable. And here's what I would say, justice must be served to the perpetrator to the highest level of the law for that particular crime and devaluing of a woman. However, many people have encouraged to end the pregnancy for the purpose of the tragic experience being erased or nullified, but in reality, clinical psychologists have continued to confirm the fact that actually it causes more trauma, causes more pain. And so my prayer is that actually, when you hear individuals say that There'll be therapy that'll take place. Actually, it adds an extra weight of pain. Why? Because now there's a moment of going, I could have done something to preserve life for that child. This is a very difficult subject matter. It's to be handled delicately in the process of all of it. But please know that I, I wish there was more time to this. But when we say that the sanctity of life matters, it matters because God says it matters. He's the giver of life. He's the taker of life. And I wanna say to somebody that's had an abortion, that the cross of Calvary forgives all sin. There is nothing you have ever done that includes an abortion that would cause Jesus to go, I can't forgive that. But I also wanna speak to men, men who have encouraged an abortion, paid for the abortion, demanded that the abortion be done. My prayer for you is that you would repent my prayer for you is that you would come before a holy God and go, I was wrong for this and seek 
to get forgiveness from that woman that you asked and actually directed to make that decision and know that the cross of Calvary forgives you as well, that you can receive forgiveness of God and a statement of repentance. But if you're here today and there, there is a woman, all, all of our campuses, listen to me, and you have just found out you're pregnant, contemplating an abortion, it's inconvenient, it's unwanted, please know, and we've done this on three occasions, please know that we will pay for every doctor's visit, every medical bill to make sure that child is brought into this world. We'll get you to an adoption agency. We'll connect you with a family so that child can be taken care of. You go, hey, that's just, man, talk is cheap. No, no, listen to me. I, I, we, we did an event at main event for 1,100 single moms and dads and, and gave them a night out. And a, and a woman of God walked up to me and said, I want you to meet my son. And so I, I was meeting this son, my wife and I, all of a sudden finding out, she goes, I was the one that had an unwanted pregnancy. He was on my way to have an abortion and I heard this message. I chose to keep the child. The church paid for every, every doctor's visit and I want you to meet my son. I didn't give him up for adoption. I chose to keep him and he's blessed my life. I melted at main event. So much more, but when we talk about marriage and family and gender, it's, it, it's important that we understand that marriage is between man and woman. Families is God's idea. Let, let me tell you, it's a good thing for a man to want to be married. It's a good thing for a man to be blessed with a wife who loves God, pursues God, and becomes fruitful and multiplies and has babies and chooses to raise young men and young ladies up in the teaching and the admonition of the Lord. It is a good thing. But we live in a culture that diminishes and seeks to deconstruct and devalue marriage and devalue the reality of what it means to actually train children in the admonition of the Lord. And when we think about this family unit, we cannot deconstruct it nor devalue it. And gender is between male and female. And the Bible defines this as the social framework of society. Religious freedom is important because we have to be very aware that there could come a day where what I'm doing right now will be considered deemed as hate speech. That day may come in our lifetime, but I need to encourage my brothers and sisters, don't you fear and don't you flinch. Let me just go ahead and say this. It, it comes with a great reminder that every nation that chose to have a state religion or control the pulpits of their churches in their nation that all of a sudden the church, the church that chooses to give its allegiance to Jesus, defying a government, that the underground church began to thrive. Can I tell you the fastest churches growing in the world are not in America. They're in Iran, Iraq, China, Asia, Africa, and any other country that's tried to suppress Christianity. And just because I, I love this proverb, and it's a great Mexican proverb, it says this, when you thought you could bury us, all you did was just plant seed. And I need you to know that this pulpit is not for sale. This pulpit and this message and this messenger cannot be swayed by any government. I need you to know it may cost me my job. It may cost me my reputation. It may cost me to be canceled by culture, but can I just say this? If I'm a dead man walking anyways, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but Christ lives in me. You can't take nothing from me because I already gave it over to Jesus. It's already his. So when we talk about justice, equality for all people, we have to understand that these are biblical convictions that care for the marginalized, that care for ethnicity, that we would not be a discriminator of color and creed and tribe and tongue because we're all made in the image of God. And so there should be equality for all people of ethnicity and socioeconomic backgrounds. However, I wanna make this statement, but when laws are being generated for the purpose of creating anti-discriminatory efforts towards 
biological men competing as transgender women, I need you to hear me say this, this justice and equality for all people includes biological females. We got to protect them from this effort of transgenderism coming into spaces that are taking opportunities that women have worked so hard to achieve. Immigration, refugees, and borders, we've spoken to this last weekend. We are called to be a nation that has law and order to submit unto law and order and to enforce laws, to have a strong border, security borders, empowerment of agents, officials to do so also. This, this is a national crisis in our world. I wanna make a statement. You don't come over a wall, under a wall, around a wall. You come through the door legally, you come through it properly, but if the door is broken, and it lets the wrong people in with ill intent and keeps the right people out, which by the way are people that that adhere and long to be a part of our nation and actually will make it better. If if that's broke, if the door is broke, then we gotta fix the door. And we gotta make sure we have secure borders, but yet our immigration uh, process and policies are for the betterment of people that long to be a part of our nation. The integrity and the candidate that we seek to elect, we've spoken to this, but we have to be very careful that even though candidates may not speak to a Christian value, we have to ask the question, it's not a right or left issue, it's an up and down issue, but the stewardship of creation of the resources and conservation of the earth, this conversation is a very prevalent and pertinent conversation, but I wanna just remind us in Genesis chapter one that God has given dominion over the earth for men and women to steward the earth, but we have dominion over the earth which means that we are a nation with resource-rich minerals that allow us to be an independent nation, not depending on on foreign nations, to to be our energy provider. Which, by the way, I think it's it's very interesting in this conversation, yet we do not seek to, to obtain resources that will allow us to have fuel and energy, but yet we will go buy this from other nations that do not support our moral ethic value of how women should be treated, how people should be treated, that operate in dictatorship and communism and the suppression of people. So we'll take your resources from your people that's exploiting your people and and we wanna talk about renewable energy, somebody needs to talk about the cobalt that gives the lithium batteries what the lithium batteries are and ask the question, where's that cobalt coming from? And oftentimes it's coming from countries that unfortunately use slave labor to get that cobalt. And so as we have these conversations, it's important that we talk about, yes, renewable energy, but where is it coming from? Also fossil fuels and gasoline and all those things matter. Here's the reason why, because when inflation goes up and gas prices go up, let me tell you who ends up getting hurt, the vulnerable, the marginalized. Because gas prices are connected to egg prices, milk prices, bread prices, And we have to understand, how do we conserve but yet use the resources respectfully to the earth that allow us to be a nation of sustainability? Supporting law and order, public safety. I wanna just say this to all our military brothers and sisters. We support you. The Bible actually supports you. (laughs) Nehemiah chapter four would say, fight for your brothers, fight for your sisters, fight for your family. Fight for your nation. It, for example, let me just say this to our military personnel. When it, when it comes to you and what you do, we're so grateful for you. Thank you for defending our borders, protecting our country, not only near and afar. But it's important that we understand as we elect an official that we have to make sure that we have a strong military. We support local law enforcement, not defund it, but actually support it. Here's the reason why, because court systems are entailed to making sure that it's connected to a reality of holding people accountable for the crimes committed so that civilizations can operate in safety and not fear. And business owners don't have to fear if they're going to find themselves as the victim of unfortunate crime. As we talk about education, curriculum, and parental involvement, you're like, Pastor Ed, you're just getting all of it. Absolutely, I got, I got one opportunity to talk to you in this. And I I need you to hear me say this, that we should value parental involvement in education. We must value. 
I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this. I heard this from Pastor Marquis, and he heard it from somebody else, and so I'm just going to make it like it's my own. God did not call me to co-parent with the government. I, I'm not co-parenting with the government. What I'm saying is, is that God gave me these children. I've been trusted to steward well. Deuteronomy chapter six tells me that I'm held accountable for this. My wife and I, Stephanie, as we seek to raise our children in the admonition of the Lord, it's important. And by the way, for educators, teachers, coaches, all of you that are serving in the school system, thank you for holding the line. Thank you for being men and women of God that choose to stand on your convictions. However, when it comes to educational information, specifically under gender dysphoria, we have to make sure that parents are a part of this conversation and that there's not information being withheld from moms and dads that should be vitally involved in the conversations of children receiving gender identification in their process, sometimes in a dysphoria. We also have to make sure that parents, by the way, it's not just voting for a president. Moms and dads, we have to be involved in PTA meetings. We have to be involved in our campuses. We have to be involved. Listen, it's more than just making comments from afar or electing an official. We have to be diligent to be involved. How can we serve our schools and our communities? As we speak of economic policies and taxation, it's important that we have wise stewardship. Proverbs 21 verse five says, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. So we have to make sure that there's fiscal responsibility that creates and supports economic growth, not at the expense of government spending. I don't know how your budget works, but if you got money, then you can spend the money, but you don't overspend. We're a nation that is increasing in a financial debt load that's causing us to be dependent on so many other nations. We have to make sure that economic policies and taxation are for our greater good. National security and foreign policy. Here's the one statement I wanna make here. We're gonna wrap this up. Globalization is a word that you need to know. Globalization is the effort of making a nation unified with other nations, losing the sovereignty of a nation for the expense of a greater collateral good, creating a, a one world government, a one world currency, You'll hear language like that. Here's what I wanna say to you. That, that should be alarming to you because that's Revelation chapter 13 that would say that there will be a political leader that will set himself up as a military leader, a financial economist that will be able to speak to a, a very successful, thriving economy. And then all of a sudden, when there's an allegiance unto him, because this is what happens, all of a sudden he's elevated, the Antichrist, which by the way, amongst us is an antichrist spirit. And so as we talk about the antichrist, by the way, the antichrist will end up in a position of power. Why? Because of political blindness. And here's the reality. As we talk to a one world government, this is how the antichrist takes over, sets himself up as God, chooses to be worshiped. And if you don't worship him, here's the deal, you don't eat. You don't get fuel, you don't get services, and unless you take the mark of the beast, and then here's what happens, you get sustained, you don't take the mark of the beast, and then all of a sudden, here's what you find yourself, is that you'll be ravaged, and you will find yourself left in the margins. All of this, by the way, when somebody says the Bible's not a political book, read the book of Revelation. So when you and I think about what's going on, I already know, let me just go ahead and address this. Some of you are like, it's so evident who you're telling us to vote for. You know why? Because you're listening through your political party. Let me just, I'm just gonna say it. You're listening through your political party. It's the truth. I, I'm telling you, I've heard it. You're telling us who to vote for without really telling us who to vote for, really. All, all I'm saying is, is that you're listening through your political allegiance. But when we just lay out biblical convictions and choose to be kingdom citizens, then we have to understand that our political allegiance, someone may get my vote, but they ain't getting my heart. You, you don't get my heart. I don't bow to an elephant. I don't bow to a donkey. I bow to a lion, and I bow to a lamb, and his name is Jesus. Come on, church, can we clap to that? But you and I have to understand that we as Christians, and I say Christians, Jesus followers, are not a silent minority. 
You have to understand that we are a vocal majority that actually, when we choose to live as kingdom citizens, salt and light gets the attention. But here's the problem. The salt has been diluted and the light has been darkened. And all I'm saying is we have to be loyal to a king. We have to be loyal to a Jesus who died, walked out that grave, and he didn't just get my vote. He got my life as Savior, Lord, and Master of all of me in my decision-making. Come on, somebody, help me, help me. Your vote should seek to expand the kingdom of God. This ain't a right or left. This is an up versus down. That's what you gotta keep in mind. Father God, I pray in Jesus' name, help us to be people that are loyal to you. Help us to be people that read our Bible, get filled with the Holy Spirit, produce the fruit of the Spirit, and live a life, even in the disagreement, that we would not demonize, but instead we would see all people made in the image of God. No matter what the election reveals, I know this for a fact, you're still on that throne, and you'll rule forever. Hey, my name's Ed Newton, pastor at Community Bible Church here in San Antonio, Texas. Thank you so much for even turning on to our YouTube channel. And if you're not subscribing right now at Community Bible Church here in San Antonio, Texas, you got to subscribe. Here's the reason why. We believe that God's given us a message rooted in His Word, empowered by the Holy Spirit that would be an encouragement to you. And if you're not subscribing right now, you got to stop what you're doing and hit that button. Also, here's what I'd say to you. Every time you watch, would you drop some comments? Let us know where you're watching from, how the message impacted you, and how we could pray for you. And would you do us a favor? One of the things that we believe oftentimes is bless people, bless people. And if this message blesses you, how about you send it to somebody else and ask them to click the subscribe button as well. And if you are planning any trip to the state of Texas, hear me when I say this, you can't come to Texas without coming to see us in San Antonio. I'd love to meet you face to face. And as always, until we meet again, much love.